stock market finished 2023 in a very positive fashion. The S&P 500 was up about 24% for the year. And since January 1, 2024, the market has generally continued upward. When I say that, I'm referring to indexes, not individual stocks. There could be some exceptions with an individual stock. The question is for investors is what is going to happen with the economy this year and what is going to happen with the stock market, which are two different things. But most people's core interest is the stock market. Hi, my name is Ben Repond. Welcome to my YouTube broadcast. Today is January 23rd, 2024. I'm going to play uh, two interviews, CNBC interviews, with two um, experts uh, who have a view that, generally speaking, 2024 is going to be positive, and that it, the momentum carried over from the last couple of months of 2023 is positive and will continue. I'm going to play one that is more cautious, particularly during the first six months, for you to hear that point of view. And then I'm going to play one that is negative, more for the long term view. And they're just different perspectives. So when you hear these things, when you hear uh, or think the market is going down for now, the question is always the key question is over what period of time are you looking for this week, this month, this quarter, this year? What is it when when those statements happen? A lot of times we hear people who are experts or read them and they are saying one thing and we read another one and says another, but they're frequently referring to different time periods and that will happen today. Uh, and I'll try to point that out to you. So I think the market is going up and I think it is going down. The question is when, over what, over what period of time? So I'll try to make that distinction. So the first, first one I'll play is Josh Ritholtz uh, is being interviewed by Scott Watmer on CNBC. And he has a very positive view. He's the CEO of Ritholtz. And that basically the, the momentum that uh, occurred from November and December is pushing into January. And I generally agree with that. Um, so his view is for 2024, or at least for the foreseeable future, things are very positive. Uh, so I'll play this piece from Josh Brown, and then um, we'll go on to the next one. Takes us to our talk of the tape, whether investor sentiment has just gotten too bullish. Let's ask Josh Brown. He's Ridholtz Wealth Management CEO and a CNBC contributor. He is with me here at Post 9. That's good to see you. Welcome back. You think that's the case? We, um, we got all bulled up because of the way we ended 23. We came in here and thought, hey, this could be smooth sailing. And maybe not so much. Let me answer your question with a question. Yeah. Do you think the market goes up because people get bulled up? Or do people get bulled up because the market went up? Well, the latter. OK, I agree with you. Why wouldn't investors be bulled up? Did you see the way that market ended last year? Sure. It literally ended like the 4th of July. It was, it was picnics and watermelon and then fireworks. And I don't know what, if you were an investor, what more you could have wanted to see. The VIX was just vol smashed almost to zero, and everything went up. Of course, people got pulled up. And that's quite all right. They should. I'd actually think there'd be something wrong if we had an S&P 500 finish the year up 25%. NASDAQ up 50 percent and nobody was bullish. That would be problematic. Yeah, but it's it's one thing to get, you know, all bulled up on um, July 4th. It's another thing to be all bulled up in March because you're waiting for the fireworks that may not go off yet because they're not supposed to go off yet. It's kind of what Jamie Dimon was talking about today out in Davos. I want to I want you to listen to what he said about this idea. I always of listen to Jamie. market goes up and everybody gets bullish. Well, maybe that's a little too much. Listen. I think it's a mistake to assume that everything's hunky dory. And you know, and when stock markets are up, it's kind of like this little drug we all feel. Like it's just great. You know? But remember, we've had so much fiscal and monetary stimulation. So I'm a little more on the cautious side that we are facing a lot of things in, 20, in 24 or 25. I mean, maybe we're coming to grips with what we're facing. Maybe rates aren't going to be straight down. Inflation's not going to be straight down. Growth's going to be a little lumpy. 
So I actually prefer my risk manager to speak the way that he does. Mm -hmm. I would be terrified if he were on the air saying, you know, uh, guns blazing, let's, let, let's have another breakout year like we had last year. That's not what he's supposed to be doing, okay? This is the head of the largest deposit institution in the United States. Uh, it's, a, it's a bulletproof bank. It should be a bulletproof bank. And the reason it is is because Jamie Dimon is a risk manager first and foremost. Continuing on with this theme, um, Dan Greenhouse and Joe Terranova continue a discussion, their thoughts on the market also continuing to propel in an upward direction, at least for the time being. So take a listen to Dan Greenhouse and Joe Terranova. It takes us to our talk of the tape, whether stocks are really back in an uptrend or if it's simply too soon to sound the all clear, even as those early month losses continue to evaporate. Let's ask Dan Greenhouse, Solus Alternative Asset Management's chief strategist with me here at Post 9. It's nice to see you again. Thank you, sir. I mean, what a difference a couple of weeks make, sure. right? In the middle of the month, you're like, all right, how deep is this correction going to be? At the low, we're down the S&P was 5.5%. Here we are. Now we're only down one and a half percent. What's happened? Yeah, I mean, you teased at the outset there that rates is a, a, a big part of this. I mean, within the context uh, that, that rates have gone up and stocks have gone up alongside it, in the last couple of days, the pullback in, in longer term rates from call it four and a quarter down closer to four uh, is probably the, the, the main input right now. And you see that the best performing sectors over that time are is both tech and comm services. It's Tesla. It's the semiconductors more specifically. And so I think it's it's hard to, to argue otherwise that rates isn't a big part of this. So are we back where we were before, where you know lower rates and then tech just carries the ball again, and that's enough to get us through this you know historically seasonally tough period? Yeah, I, I don't know that we were ever out of whatever it is that we've been in since since March. Well, Let's call it an uptrend. Was, though that like the uptrend was over, and we were going to have this correction that was you know likely going to be a bit steeper than we witnessed at just five and a half percent. And that narrative has changed once again. See, I th now I'm going to go to the other side. I'm going to play some, you'll find this interesting. So if you've listened for the last year or so, you know that um, I've played Tom Lee from uh, Fund, Fundstrat. And uh, he is typically, and last year, he was always bullish and thinking the market is going to go up, up, up. And his prediction on what the market would do and what it did were spot on. Matter of fact, I think he got it more right on what he called and what it did than anybody on Wall Street, or at least that's what they're saying. So, uh, but he was known at that point, he became sort of known as a perma bull. He's this, whatever the question was, the market's gonna go up. Well, he was right. But now he's taking the view in 2024 that he believes there will be a correction, not a crash, but a correction. And he believes that is going to occur in probably the first six months. And, but by the end of the year, he thinks that uh, the market will still be positive. So it's a, it's a good, it's a balanced view. It makes sense to me, uh, probably makes more sense than the other two. Uh, but anyway, it's a different perspective. And I thought I'd play this for you from Tom Lee. So let's kick off the hour with a man who never skips. One of the biggest bulls on Wall Street, Fundstrat's Tom Lee. And I shouldn't have said that because you think the first part of this year, despite being bullish for the whole year, could be a little bit skimpy in terms of return. Uh, yes, Brian. I, I, I think we've got to digest that huge move you talked about. Where is Tom months. Lee and what have you done with him? You were Mr. Bull last year. You were right on the mark about everything, and now you're a little more cautious. Yeah, maybe it's because I skimped on the appetizers. That's it. That's well, uh, later. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm still optimistic for the year, but you know, in the first half, and we got a glimpse of that today with uh, Fed governors talking about not sure how many cuts they want to do. That's going to make markets nervous, and we got a pretty lousy Empire Survey reading today, a regional PMI, and that's going to get people worried about a soft landing or hard landing. Those don't, don't get answered for the next six months. So I think it's possible that we make a, a minor new high before the end of the month, and then we might have something like a 7% drawdown. The, the Fed governor you're referring to is a gentleman named Christopher Waller, very smart guy, but he's not Jerome Powell. He is not the chair of the Federal Reserve. With all due respect to Mr. Waller, why is Wall Street suddenly paying so much attention 
to the, these one or two couple comments? It's a, it, it's a fair question. We, we know for the last two years the Fed's been fighting inflation. So we know what that kind of regime and playbook is. Now we're moving to a playbook of, well, inflation is slowing. The Fed wants to keep real rates from getting too high. But we don't know what kind of cuts and when those happen. That's the nervousness we're going to have over the next six months. I don't like to place too much credence in one month of data, particularly among some of these sort of smaller or more regional Fed surveys or surveys of this or surveys of that. You referenced one, though. This is the Empire Manufacturing Survey, folks. If you don't know what we're talking about, don't worry. 95% of you probably don't. It is a manufacturing survey around New York State. And usually it gets completely ignored by Wall Street. Nobody cares except this data point. Correct me if I'm wrong, Tom. Came in so awful that even people who didn't care about this Empire survey suddenly started to care. Yeah, it was pretty atrocious. It was awful. But is, you think it's just one noisy data piece? Uh, there's a lot of things that can make it noisy. Uh, we know supply chains are being rerouted right now, and we know markets have been tumultuous. And you know we've seen that during weeks of market corrections, regional surveys often tank because the pur purchasing manager might just say things are worse, but it gets because the stock market's down. So it's really hard to know how much is signal versus other things contributing to it. Now, in the past, the past couple of years, I have played two or three pieces from Jeremy Grantham, at least two, maybe three. Uh, Jeremy Grantham is the co-founder of um, Grantham, Mayo, and Van Otterloo in Boston. The last time I looked, they manage around $70 billion. I think that number is quite a bit higher at this point, uh, but very successful in his 80s, uh, accomplished a lot over his lifetime, and with the money that they manage, I suspect that a decent portion of that is from the very wealthy people. And very wealthy people, uh, they call them ultra high net worth individuals or, you know, people with a, very, a lot of money. Uh, they seek out firms like his and they do that. They're, they're very smart people and they have very smart advisors. So he has to be successful to attract that kind of money. And probably can't rest on his laurels. So uh, he has been saying for some time that there is going, that we're in a super bubble and it is going to crash for years. Well, he has be, been criticized both um, the media and on Wall Street and certainly by people who even listen to my channel who have trashed him and saying he's a perma bear. He's got it wrong for so many years. So let me, in defense of Jeremy Grantham, let me say this before I play this piece. I don't think he has gotten it wrong. You have to understand his perspective. He is a macro view guy, and he looks for, more than anything else, he's looking for super bubbles. The ones in 29 and 72 and 2000, 2008, the ones that have really crashed, and he says we're in one now. What that means to me is that if we are in a super bubble, bubble in a macro super bubble, that uh, it could be years before it crashes. But it doesn't mean we're not in one. And that is often the way super bubbles go, is that they continue, the market continues to go higher, even though the market is extremely overbought and uh, in relatively high risk uh, territory. So he's going to speak to this, but I just want you to have the perspective. You can still, if you don't want to believe him, that's fine. It's up to you. But uh, just it, keep in mind that he is looking, looking at a macro view period of time. And, uh, but he does make the case for it. And it is based, typically, it's based on earnings. When, and he quotes quite a bit of earnings. When earnings get to a certain level, that is not sustainable. So um, anyway, take a listen to this. And I think you'll, from a macro perspective, I think you'll see you know, what he is saying. Uh, and I do agree with his point of view. I think we are going to have a super crash that is preceded by a super bubble, uh, and it will be horrific. I don't think it's immediate. I could be wrong, 
but uh, at some point, the air, the excess air has got to come out of this balloon. And uh, it has been built up and built up with money that has been printed and borrowed, um, which in my view are about the same thing. And um, it, the world is awash in credit, again, excess credit. And um, the, sooner or later, this has got to get reconciled. It's got to, the air has got to come out of the balloon. So anyway, take a listen to Jeremy Grantham. I think you'll enjoy this. All I do is look at the history and say, the best guess is that a bubble will behave like a bubble. And the more remarkable meta-level question is how come people can get away with saying nobody saw it coming? Each time, nobody saw it coming. When the data is screaming that you can't possibly miss it, you first semester course of statistics, you could not miss 1929. You could not miss 1972. You absolutely categorically could not miss 2000 when it went to 35 times earnings. The previous high PE had been 21. It went to 35 for heaven's sake. In Japan, it went to 65. No, you cannot miss these bubbles. And you could not miss the one in 2021. It went to a, a peak that rivaled 2000. And in some ways it was cheaper, some ways it was more expensive, but it was a very, very obvious bubble. Do not tell me uh, that you can't see these things. And they all break, no exceptions. And uh, if you say that, you'll be called a permabet. But history is quite clear. There are clear bubbles. They have always broken. This one is breaking. What is the average consequence? It always happens uh, in every bubble because you start with such euphoria and, and such perfection fundamentally that deterioration is a heartbreaker. If you really believe that good times would roll forever, then you're not only dealing with bad information, you're dealing with a heartbreak. You know, you're disappointed. You have been let down by the system. And once again, the, the stresses are very high and something will break. I never, yes, I'm surprised it was Silicon Valley Bank. But I am not surprised that there was something surprising like Silicon Valley Bank. I would have been surprised if, if nothing had cracked um, and maybe next month, maybe early next year. But when you keep up a pressure, we have more debt now than we have ever had. We probably have more debt than we realize. It is well argued by some people. And uh, consequently, when you put the interest rates up, you have uh, in the banking system $600 billion of unrealized losses. But in the system writ large, you, you have a lot of pain already, quite a few trillion dollars, and, uh, and quite a few trillion more likely to come. And everything has consequences. When you write down perceived value by many trillions of dollars, and it will be more than 10 by the end, for sure, uh, collectively, and you've got multiple asset classes contributing, they all have consequences. And you should not be surprised if a chunk of the credit system comes under stress. And maybe you shouldn't be surprised if we get lucky this time and muddle through. But these are the kind of things that have happened in each of the prior cycles. And uh, as a general principle, the bigger and broader the bubble, the longer and more painful the downside. Japan, uh, the biggest of all, is not back to the high of 1989 in the stock market. It's not back to the high in land or real estate. That's getting to be quite a long time. That's 30, 34 years and counting, uh, and, and it still hasn't reached the old high in nominal terms. So, you know, the biggest lag getting back to a high ever and the biggest pain, but it was the biggest bubble. It, it's perfectly symmetrical. And this one is pretty damn big and it's bigger than 2000 because it includes real estate and bonds. And that one did not. Now on my slide, I saved this to last because I wanted you to hear these perspectives before I covered this. Um, and maybe particularly Jeremy Grantham, but the, the, the title on this is that the market is overvalued based on P.E. ratio. P.E. ratio is price to earnings ratio. It's a number, but it's the price of the stock of an index or a company uh, divided by its earnings, its profits. And so uh, that number historically in the S&P 500 has been about 19, or you could say 19 to one. Today, the S&P 500 is about 23 to one. And so it is overvalued by about 
So if the market were to adjust itself to what is the norm based on earnings, the prices of stocks or indexes would have to come down about 20%. In my view, that, you know, that would not be fun, but that's not a crash. So uh, I, I think, you know, whatever, if Tom Lee is right and the market comes down 7%, okay, it's starting to address that. If the market came down 15 to 25%, it would say to me, it is really truly addressing the degree to which it is overbought. When markets come down, for whatever reason, the, they don't typically, and let's just say earnings, they don't typically come down to the norm. And let's say it's 19 to 1. It doesn't drop from 23 to 19. It doesn't work that way. It'll come down to something less than that or something more than that. And it, it oftentimes will overshoot that. So uh, I think that is, that is in our future. I think it's in our intermediate term future, maybe this year, maybe next year. Uh, that would not surprise me to see that kind of a correction. But so far, so far, we are benefiting. I am and you are, if you're invested in the market, benefiting from the continuation of this bull run that began in early November. Um, from our own investment strategy, we uh, got in the market the first week, at the end of the first week of November, we'd been out of the market because it had, was in a pullback, and we're, we got in the market, we, and then we, get, we got in the Dow. The Dow is a value index, and that was what our investment was during the last, beginning in the end of the first week of November through the year. And then in early January, we shifted to the NASDAQ 100, which is a growth index, very different than the Dow. And we've been in the, the NASDAQ 100 uh, ever since that time and have enjoyed some excellent gains both uh, in the last couple of months of 2023 and in 2024. I hope you, uh, through your own method, have done uh, the same or maybe even better than that. I hope that for you. So I just thought I would cover this PE ratio thing just to show the degree that it is overvalued. Look, a bull market, it almost looks real. Thank you for watching. If you have questions or comments, leave them in the comment section below.